Science and Mathematics and has a postgraduate diploma in Information Security Management. John also holds several professional certifications, including CISSP, I, John will have to tell you what these stand for because I don't know, CISA and CRISC. John has worked in information technology related roles for many years in both Atlantic and Western Canada and in the UK. He does have a life outside of information security, he tells us. <laughs> and in his spare time, he takes care of his bicycle and his family. Welcome, John. Number one, one. Hello. OK, that's great. Um, so George Orwell set his novel, 1984. It was only uh, 28 years ago. And in a very uh, twisted example of life imitating art, um, this totalitarian society that he portrayed, he kind of lived it because when he started the book and before he uh, finished it, he was under government surveillance the entire time, over 20 years. It only ended with his death in 1959. So I've always thought that was a little uh, strange, life imitating art. Somehow, new presenter tool. Not working, one moment. So George Orwell, and that's because of his bohemian dress and communist views, so he was watched by MI5 for over 20 years. The term Orwellian, as we know, is, means totalitarian society under constant surveillance, and it's this constant surveillance that I find most interesting. These two go together, by the way. Um, so this is going to be a, thank you, a personal observations on surveillance. Okay, I deserve a groan for that one, my personal observations. Still not working, I'll just stand here. Um, so it's also a love-hate relationship that I have with surveillance. And let me explain that. Thank you. Thank you, Vanna. Okay, so this will date me a little bit, but I grew up in the 70s watching the original Mission Impossible TV series, and I love the gadgets. For me, it was always about the gadgets. Um, another series that I watched, the, the movie series, the James Bond, I'm sure many of you have seen that. And uh, other than sharing initials with James Bond, my, uh, <laughs> I, I have no, uh, I don't actually even like that character very much. He's kind of misogynistic. The character I like the most was Q. He's basically this uber Santa who would deliver all these cool gadgets at the beginning of the series. So I love surveillance gadgets just because you, you can do really cool things with them. At the same time, this is a, um, hate's kind of a strong word, but I'm strong, uh, very distressed or disturbed by surveillance. And I'll use these people as a, to a way of explaining it. That goes back to my childhood as well. In the 1920s, my grandparents emigrated from what the present day Ukraine, came to Canada. I didn't get to know them very well, but. One story I remember is that any letters that came from the old country, as they called it, and sometimes photographs, if you held them up to light, you could see through them. Words were cut out. So the, the censors in the Soviet Union would surveil their mail. That really, really disturbed me. So um, that's a love-hate relationship. Uh, just like with George Orwell, the life imitates art and art imitates life. Um, I think that really is the case. So I want to use lots of movie references today. Uh, before we get any further, privacy is about a lot of different things. It's about, sometimes it's about sharing information, but with just people that you want to share it with, confidentiality, the right to be left alone, a whole bunch of things are embodied in that. But the person who's broken that down the best, I think, is Daniel Solov in his Taxonomy of Privacy. And I'll just point out, surveillance is on the list. So there's 16 topics. I won't belabor that, but have a look at his book, Understanding Privacy, a really, really good book. And first I want to talk about the surveillance of things. Now you might not think that's really surveillance, because it's not people, but the surveillance of big things does make a difference. And bear with me as I explain why. Has anybody, I'll use ships as an example. Has anybody heard of this website, marinetraffic.com? Few people. Um, 
I'm a cyclist, and when I'm cycling home and I see a cruise ship or a freighter, in the last six years since I've lived here, I've become fascinated with them, and I want to know, you know have they uh, ever changed the name of that vessel? Where does it come from? Um, what path did it take to get here? Did it come from South America, Asia? So if you go to this website, in case you haven't seen it before, that's a typical day in the Halifax Harbor. Um, all those colored spots, they represent passenger vessels, cargo vessels, tankers. And what I love about this, even if the, the vessel is in the distance and you can't read the name, when you get home, open up your web browser or on your tablet, open up your web browser and you can find out all the details about it. It's really, really handy. Um, you can maybe make out it says AIS in the URL. That's the Automated Information System. These are systems that, by law, they have to be on any vessel over 299 tons. And uh, they are continually sending out data. There's a unique, what's called MS, MMSI number for each vessel. And they send out ship speed and location information. Um, does anybody recognize this place? It's in the news last week. Off the coast of Italy, there was a, uh, the Costa Concordia. So when I heard that story about the cruise ship running aground, quickly logged on, and uh, not logged on, sorry, it's a public website where you can go and track these big things. And I noted where the first collision occurred, where the captain changed his heading, then he tried to get off of this shelf to no avail. He's going 2.9 knots, and then finally the last reading at 1.1 knots. So it's very interesting to me that we can watch these things. And um, are there any privacy concerns, like those 16 points that Solov wrote about, there are areas where there could be privacy concerns. Well, before I talk about that, one other example, more of you may have seen this. Flightview.com, um, very, very handy if you're going to pick up relatives at the airport, you can find out is the plane still in Toronto. And if you just keep refreshing the screen, these little blue and red planes will move along. And the uh, Stanfield Airport is not the only place where you can do this. There are many airports across North America. At the bottom, it's kind of interesting to note that it's delayed by five minutes. Like the boat data is not delayed, but this is. So are there uh, privacy problems? Well, not really, because it's not one to one. There's not one person on this vehicle. There might, in the case of an aircraft, be 500, or you know, dozens of people working on a freighter. So not really any privacy problems as far as I'm concerned. Technology benefits. Remember I said I have a love-hate relationship with surveillance technology or gadgets or services? Well, huge benefits. Some, uh, like Michael Power said earlier, you know, it's not the technology that's bad, it's how you use it or how you use the data. So collision avoidance, that's what the marinetraffic.com is all about. The people on those vessels, they get the real data, real-time data, and they can see where the other vessels are. Avoid collisions. There's accountability. If somebody is flying a multi-hundred million dollar aircraft, they should be accountable to someone. Like with the crew, captain and crew of the Costa Concordia, they can run, but they can't hide. We know exactly where they went. Uh, if you try finding now, it's off the air, by the way. Um, customer satisfaction, like I said, you don't go to the airport needlessly to pick up your relatives, and it's kind of fun. So tracking big objects is not really a surveillance issue. For medium size, I'll use one example, automobiles. And you can kind of see where I'm going. Like, there's a gradient to privacy. It's not binary. Um, there are things, technologies, or devices that you can use for tracking vehicles. Some of them are installed deliberately on fleet vehicles. Some of them are personal choice. I actually have one. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Then there's the surreptitious ones. That's the thing from the spy movies that I was so intrigued with as a kid, and I still am. JB, remember? <clears throat> um, so just really quickly, you go on a list. There's OBD, onboard data recorders. They're, they're installed at the factory. They record minimal amounts of information. It's basically enough information to give you the check engine light. But then you can go and do aftermarket ones, like I have. Let's you analyze exhaust gas temperature over time, um, ignition timing. Really, really useful for servicing your own vehicle. Fleet black boxes, so somebody driving a very, very expensive tractor-trailer unit, they should be liable. School buses where lots of lives are at stake. And these are installed with the knowledge of the operator. They know the black box is there. RFIDs for toll bridges. Now, some of you may have opted to get these. Uh, locally, it's called the Mac Pass. If you go over the McKay or McDonald Bridge, 
rather than fumbling for change, you can have this RFID, radio frequency identifier device in your windshield. I'm sure you all know about that, but I, I just want to point out that that's optional. You don't need that. Um, then there are voluntary black boxes. Some jurisdictions, I haven't heard of this in Canada, but I've heard about it in some states where for insurance discounts, you uh, have a black box installed. So when there's a collision, um, they look through the black box, they look and find out that you've, yes, you always stop at stop signs, you never speed or almost never, so you'll get the settlement in your favor. That's the idea there. ALPR, that's something that the police use, a device they can point at vehicle, it'll read the license plate, optical character recognition occurs, it communicates back to the database and gives the name of, not the driver, the registered owner. So uh, the reason I mentioned that, it's not really one-to-one, -one, but it's closer. And then some uh, states are talking about legislating black boxes just because there's so many uh, fatalities on the roads. So privacy problems, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's a lot closer. The registered owner of the vehicle. Um, and it's only really an issue if the databases are not properly protected. Like that police database that the ALPR communicates with it shouldn't be wide open. If they protect that database, it's only the police who we trust, who can't, or, or they're the only ones who can access that data. And you have to be close enough with RFID technology anyway, it's fairly close. In theory, some could, someone could build a detector network that surrounds Halifax and Dartmouth, and eventually you could build up a history of where a certain vehicle kept traveling the same route, but you still don't know who that is. Uh, benefits, well, they're huge, uh, most of them to do with safety, for example, with the, uh, the fleet black boxes. Accountability, same thing. And that's the uh, device I use. Just plugs in under the steering column. Lots of really useful engine data. Okay, moving down to smaller things. This is sometimes called the Internet of Things, um, especially if it's their network devices. I just want to look at things that can be worn or carried. It's mostly a mix of RFID. That's where a device will ping the transponder and then it reports the data back. And there's also GPS, so really good examples of sports gear. You can buy an insert that fits in your Nike shoe. Has everybody heard of those? A few people. Um, if you're a runner, walker, um, lets you track your exercise. So the device itself measures acceleration in your gait through the RFID technology, broadcasts it to your iPod. Really, really handy. Uh, the Garmin devices, most of the guys I go cycling with, most of the people I go cycling with, they happen to all be guys, but um, they uh, have, lots of them have these Garmin um, devices that they'll measure, because they're using GPS, they can height information. I see someone in the audience who I, I know has one as well uh, for when he's running. Fantastic, you get back, you plug it in, it draws out a map of exactly where you went. Really useful. Uh, passports, more and more passports, more and more jurisdictions are putting them in their passports. On clothing, uh, why would you want RFID tags in your clothing? It'd be incredible. Load every piece of clothing into the washer, let it sort out what to do. Uh, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um, it could eat, like, because the RFID tags are unique, it can say, wait a minute, I haven't seen that pair of socks in three weeks. That's a problem. So, you know, soap, <laughs> soap could be metered out and uh, temperature, well, after looking at all the devices, well, okay, there's some whites, there's some colors, well, here's the temperature to you. So, very handy uh, pros, yeah, I was listing them as I went along, lots and lots of pros. For cons, I mean, you're getting pretty close to one-to-one. -one. You know, something you wear or you carry, and I conveniently skipped out one device, I'm pretty sure everyone here has in your pocket. Um, you can guess what it is, but I'll come back to that. Um, a big topic is cameras, hence the big font. So I don't know how to put this other than just asking, are we all voyeurs? Now, th think about it. Um, we're fascinated by a parent's face when we're born. I mean, that's quite normal and understandable, but what's the first thing that we teach kids? Peekaboo, I see you. And uh, once they acquire language, I spy with my little eye. <clears throat> and then when you can run and crawl, it's hide and go seek. Once we get mature, then we watch reality TV shows, <laughs> such as Big Brother. Okay, and 
for further proof, uh, what's the, everyone's favorite Hitchcock movie? Most people say it's Rear Window. Uh, and if you haven't seen this movie, the protagonist is a photographer. He's got a broken leg. Uh, it's a really hot week in New York City. He spends his time in front of his window recuperating. All his neighbor's windows or blinds are open, and he begins watching them and trying to figure out what's going on. One really poignant scene has him reaching for his binoculars, and there's this internal dialogue you can see in his face where he's thinking, well, that would be kind of twisted. Instead, he reaches for his camera with his huge telephoto lens. And what's the difference, really? <laughs> anyway, no, we're not voyeurs. I'm just trying to make the point that, that we do like watching. It is actually completely natural. We're just interested in, in our fellow human beings. I, I believe that. Um, it's almost always, almost always, just curiosity and out of concern for others. So uh, here's a film that captures both of those. It's a German language film. There are subtitles. The Lives of Others. Uh, in this film, and I won't give away the, anything that ruins it for you, but the Stasi... Oh, the film is set in 1984, by the way. Made in 2006, but set in 1984 in East Germany, where the Stasi is still basically monitoring everyone. So this one agent, he's uh, got some people he's supposed to monitor, but he starts to empathize with them as time goes along, and I won't give away anything else, but it, he takes some measures to help them. So, you know, it, we're not really voyeurs. There are some voyeuristic states, though, and that's where Big Brother comes in. This term was coined by Orwell, Big Brother. It's the government or the state. Uh, in the UK, Surveillance is so big that they sometimes call it the fifth utility. There's gas, electricity, water, telecommunications, and now surveillance. The UK commissioner just a few years ago, he said that he's concerned that Britain is sleepwalking into a surveillance society. Uh, others have raised alarm in the UK and said, wait a minute, 1984 wasn't an instruction manual, you guys. So, you know, why do I keep mentioning the UK? Because it's sort of the, a really big case, and they went there a bit earlier than the rest of us. And this is a map from privacyinternational.org. It's a little dated now. It's 2007. But you can see the black are sort of not good. They're endemic surveillance societies. And the UK is definitely in there. And for them, it's mostly because of cameras. If you go to privacyinternational.org, you'll see the numerous categories for the rankings. But in the UK, it's mostly cameras. And that's my uh, section I'm talking about right now. Uh, this is really well il illustrated in the miniseries, five-part miniseries, The Last Enemy. Highly recommend it. The, I read the behind the scenes by the director, he or the writer. As he was writing this, he wanted it to represent slightly future society. So what was it, 2008 when he did it? Um, but as he was finishing it, like he had the surveillance cameras with audio. Now, surveillance cameras were everywhere in the UK, but they didn't have audio. And he started thinking, well, maybe that's pushing it. Then they added audio before he finished. You know, real life and art are you know, going neck and neck all the time. So he had real trouble keeping that ahead. Uh, little Brothers, that's the other big category, great category of watchers. Now, who are Little Brothers? It's a long list. Weather cams, store cams, nanny cams, hair salon cams, taxi cams, bus cams, neighborhood watch cams, office cams, ATM cams, backup cams, windshield cams, bike cams, and the list goes on and on. I'll mention ATM cams again in a minute. That's just cameras. There are other types of surveillance, but that's a huge list. Uh, not all of it's bad. Like, remember, it's non-government. That's who Little Brother is. So Google Street View is part of the Little Brother. And it's a great thing. I love Street View. I couldn't live without it. So remember, technology is not necessarily bad or evil, it's how it's used or how it's regulated that's going to be part of the solution. Uh, Street View, I had the good fortune to go to Rome on vacation last year. We stayed in a convent. It's a really interesting alternative to hotels, cheaper, cleaner, very friendly. Before we got there, I spent a week before, I used Street View to figure out exactly where it was so I wouldn't get, be lost. When we were there, we I had the map and we got ourselves pretty close and then I said, hey, I recognize it. I recognize that road. It's just up there and to the left. And sure enough, it was. So uh, street view is fantastic. I don't see any, personally, I don't see any privacy issues with it. Uh, collectively, though, the Little Brothers are a problem, mostly because they don't have enough resources 
Like all those people operating the webcam in their little shop, they don't have the money and time resources to manage it properly. There's just too many stories of nanny cams being accidentally left wide open, seven by 24. And there's accountability. Who, yeah, it's in Latin, who watches the watchers? I won't try to say the Latin. Who watches the watchers and makes sure that cameras installed and used for a proper purpose? Well illustrated in the other area where uh, art imitates life, uh, Simpsons, an episode called To Surveil with Love. Oh, I'm going to go back and tell you the setup in case you haven't seen it. Um, there's a backstory, but eventually the whole town's covered with cameras, and the town do gooder, Ned Landers, is in charge of watching them, and he misuses that trust placed in him. Anyway, it all ends with him saying, I didn't mean to be a big brother, I just wanted to be a little sister, trying to make everyone behave. Little sister, little brother, same thing. Um, this is a really interesting development, I think, the crowdsourcing of the analysis of surveillance. So the Vancouver riots, there, there's lots of footage from the police, but they're also asking for footage from the public, and they're asking the public to help identify. Now, I've redacted the one photo, but if you go to the website, uh, vancouver.ca slash police, I believe, there are photos there, and they're asking you to submit videos and identify people. So basically, it's big brother and little brother working together. It's a family affair. <laughs> um, the other automated analysis I find interesting is the facial recognition. This was well illustrated in art in Minority Report. Again, there's a backstory. In fact, the main story here was pre-crime detection, you know, thought, policing of thoughts. Setting that aside, they, are, they do have really, really good iris recognition. And there's a scene here from where a character is walking through a mall, detects his iris, figures out who he is, and then gives him targeted ads. You know, John Bullock, you haven't been to Rome in a while, maybe book another trip. Uh, kind of useful, I guess. Uh, problem there is why is the store linking to the government's database? Anyway, issue right there. but. Uh, the, anyway, that's in art and in life. Iris at Heathrow, that's been there since 2005. Love the acronym, uh, Iris Recognition Immigration System. But I deliberately did not define surveillance until now because I think most of us know it when we see it. You can groan again. Bad pun. Um, anyway, surveillance comes from two French words, su, meaning above, and ve, to view, pardon my pronunciation, but to view from above. But there's also surveillance, su from French meaning below, to view from below. We're actually doing this all the time today, and you might not have, has anybody heard of that term? A few, okay. Uh, don't worry if you haven't, it doesn't really matter. But this was coined by Steve Mann at University of Toronto about 30 years ago. He's been doing research on this. He started wearing a camera every waking minute. He said he'd rather be in a society that had no state surveillance, no Big Brother surveillance, but because it's there, we should all be wearing cameras to sell, tell our side of the story. Um, and it's from, so it's from the participant's point of view, i.e. inverse surveillance. Perfect example of the democratizing effect is the Rodney King beatings in uh, 1991. And then, or, yeah, 1991, and then the riot in 1992 during the trial. I think it was all white police, or predominantly white police, had beat this black man. Their side of the story was basically going to be the truth. Luckily, somebody had their own footage, and they showed what really happened. So it's democratizing. And like I said, we're doing this all the time now. Cyclists are wearing cameras in case there's a collision to prove who's at fault, dash cams, blogs. You know, look at this slob. They left a mess on the bus. This is happening all the time now, where people are posting pictures of others. Um, again, Simpsons art illustrating life. In this episode, uh, Homer is falsely accused of sexual harassment. I can't remember now if it's through camera footage or just word of mouth, but eventually someone comes forward and they have their own footage, and Marge, I won't try to do her voice. Uh, the courts might not work anymore, but as long as everybody is videotaping everybody else, justice will be done. That's exactly what surveillance is. Now, where are all these cameras? We heard about the big brother cams and the little brother cams and the rest. I left out cell phones until now. 
if you don't mind putting up your hand, is there anyone who has a cell phone without a camera? Congratulations. There's somebody who didn't feel the need to buy the latest gadget. I love gadgets, but that's great. But almost everyone else's camera or phone has a camera in it. Every laptop has a camera in it. Every tablet has two now. Very, very easy to believe there are probably 200 cameras in this room. Where else are they? I bought this, uh, just received it, I haven't tried it yet, but the videos on the web look incredible. It's, it's magnified a bit on the screen, but it's a tiny key fob. It's a high definition webcam with a micro SD RAM slot, uh, $35, including shipping from China. Really, really high quality. All the RC modelers are using them. Um, you know, for once I can have something on my bike where if I crash, I won't be worried about losing a really expensive, bulky camera. If I lose this, I'll just buy another one. Uh, send in the drones. There ought to be drones, with apologies to Joan Collins. Um, these came out just before Christmas. I, I'm pretty sure a few people in the room probably have them. There are other geeks in the room, I know that. Uh, very, very cheap. There's a camera in the front, camera in the bottom. So these things are in the air now. It, wasn't just, it was just the military at first who had drones. Now we're all going to have drones. So basically, cameras are everywhere. This is my favorite TV show right now, Person of Interest. Um, it's my favorite because they finally solved that problem of this sort of magical surveillance. All the shows of the past that I still love, um, it, whether it's an individual crime fighter or the government fighting crime, they could look at any point in the world anytime they wanted with a super high-res image. It was just so unbelievable. You had to suspend your disbelief. You don't with this show because they're just using all the other cameras available that are already there on the ground, not some mysterious satellite that they have to have in the right place. Um, in a way, they're using the big brothers and the little brothers because they're, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Okay, it's television, but they're hacking into the ATM cams the nanny cams and the government cams. So they finally solved that problem. Just by being last, you know, they can take advantage of all the cameras. Um, so I didn't mean to scare you. I just want to raise awareness. Really, I'm not trying to scare you. Um, try to leave you with a few coping strategies because the cameras are everywhere. So we have to understand what's a private place and what's a public place. For example, in a car park, we may have thought in the past, well, the car's everywhere, but there are no people here, so you might have you know, sang off key or whatever you might have done in the car park. Assume there are cameras. There are going to be dash cams, cameras on the uh, backup cams on the back of the cars. We mistakenly used to think that's a private place. And I just use that as one example, but we have to really be clear what's, uh, you know, line our expectations with reality. What is really a private place? Learn about services before you start using them. I'll give you one other example. Marinetraffic.com, or, or one example of this. You can, you can, by the way, go to that website and you can say, yeah, I want to volunteer. They'll send you a free receiver. You just provide power and internet. And you can be part of this crowdsourcing, which is really cool. I don't think it's a uh, privacy issue, but I just found out yesterday, they published your um, latitude and longitude to three digits. I don't think that's a problem, but I'm just using this as an example to know what you're getting into. Do I have one minute left? It's not working. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, um, please give me a sign when I'm done. Uh, exercise your power when shopping. And by this, I mean, we all expect websites to have a privacy policy now. It's kind of, especially most of the people in this audience would be thinking that way. Well, you know, maybe it's time that we had a surveillance policy in the stores. The cameras are so small, you're not going to see them. Like I recently was in Shoppers Drug Mart. Uh, I think Walmart's the same, where there are massive cameras all over. They might not even be cameras. They could be dummies. But the real cameras, remember how small they are. thought I lost it for a minute. They're so tiny, you can't see them anymore. So we're going to have to hold, whether it's a store or any of these little brothers, we have to hold them accountable. Let's see some policies. Um, support your privacy regulators and privacy organizations, some of whom are in the back today. Because we can't stay on top of everything ourselves. But, and do keep tabs on Big Brother and hold them accountable. Um, this is a story that came out, I think it's only a couple of weeks ago. WikiLeaks released a story about surveillance companies, and remember it's not always cameras, 
Some of them are selling malware that governments are buying to install on other people's computers to monitor them through their computers. Remember, it's not just cameras. They're your web activity. So you know, keep tabs. Uh, you can, there's a web page you can go to. Uh, United Nations of Surveillance is, will be a way to find it. It's a .eu. They've got a really good interactive map. And uh, my last movie reference, in the words of V from v for, v for Vendetta, people shouldn't be afraid of the government. Government should be afraid of the people. I, I believe that. I, that doesn't mean blow up parliament. Sorry, plot spoiler. <laughs> plot spoiler. Um, but just if you don't like them, you have the power of voting them out. Maybe that's one more option. Okay, finally, a, f a footnote. I finally did have the chance to go back to my grandparents' old country. And uh, Big Brother was really, really evident in two places especially. I went to all the Eastern European capitals, and Prague and Budapest especially, there are cameras everywhere. Again, maybe they're dead, you know, non-functioning because they're not as wealthy as the UK. I don't know, but the cameras are everywhere. I fought back my own little way by taking pictures of all the cameras looking at me. <laughs> my photo album is really boring. <laughs> but, so honestly, I'm not trying to sow fear. Just know what you're getting into. Be aware, and we will get through it. We'll get legislation in place. We'll get this thing sorted out. Let's take our lead from the resiliency of the, uh, the Czechs and the Hungarians, and from the t-shirt sellers. And so let's have a good laugh. This is what I bought. This was, I saw this everywhere. The KGB is still watching you. So you know, if, if they can <laughs> laugh at it, and the, in Georgia there's actually a restaurant with that exact same title. KGB still watching you. That's the name of the restaurant. So do I have time for questions? One, two questions. Anybody have any questions? I, hopefully that was somewhat entertaining. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. Before you go, John, I have one question. Yes. Are those really buttons? <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. 